pastor's log, quarantine date, 5-2020. The year we wish we could forget, but probably never can. Today the church is eerily quiet. Not even a creature is stirring, including the pesty cricket back in the boiler room, who loves to stay warm. There are no sounds of children rushing through the halls. The coffee pot isn't percolating. Or the worship team isn't warming up. Strange. There's a full supply of TP in all the laboratories, but I can't find a soul aboard. It's been 14 days since the vanishing. Honestly, I don't know if I can handle this isolation anymore. All the chatter in my head. It's coming to a crescendo. Am I the only one out here floating hopelessly in the dark? How am I supposed to respond to this current pandemic? All my attempts to hailing frequencies, they've all failed. Life support is at 5%. All this seems to be highly illogical. couldn't help myself but to try to recreate some type of parody. Corny at best, but hey, at least I tried. The things we do when we have extra time on our hands, and I'm sure some of you are seeing this as well. Well, today what I want to do is speak to you about our initial response to highly illogical or unforeseen circumstances. How each individual response to certain matters, it, it varies. And this can be tied to our culture, it can be tied to our personalities, and even past experiences. Now, have you ever been overly critical of someone who responded to a tragedy or anxiety? I'm sure we all have. It's possible that in some respects, uh, some of our frustration is uh, from our own perspective, how we view things from our own perspective, where we wish that others would uh, respond in the manner that we're accustomed to. Well, dear friends, uh, that isn't reality. Surprisingly, we're not all robots. We're not the Borg. Uh, we respond differently. For the next few moments, what I'd like to do with you is point to Mordecai and Esther's initial response to the edict that stated that all the Jews in Xerxes' kingdom would be exterminated by year's end. As you can imagine, fear and chaos ran through the streets. And it was for good reason, because this was a very dramatic measure that was taking place. Esther chapter 4 verse 1 through 3 in the Bible, we read this. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, and he went out in the city wailing loudly and bitterly. But he only went as far as the king's gate, because no one who was clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter in it. Every province to which the edict and the order that of the king came there was great mourning among the Jews, and they were fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. It's important to understand that Middle Eastern culture is far different than ours, even to this day. Uh, even uh, this situation in Esther chapter 4, uh, we see this take place in the Middle East now today where people will put on sackcloth and ashes and they mourn and they weep bitterly in the streets. Again, there isn't 
one way necessarily to grieve. Americans were more reserved, I guess you could maybe say, for the most part. Esther herself, she was in great distress. And as this all began to play out, she and Mordecai, they conversed back and forth through some intermediaries. The gravity of the situation became very heavy. Mordecai, he sent an actual copy of this edict, which was being distributed through the cities and beyond. He wasn't overreacting in any sense or exaggerating at all. The threat, it was extremely real. Esther, she was in quite a predicament. We might say she was between a rock and a hard place. One might assume easily, hey, this is Queen Esther and she has some serious clout with the king. Not quite, just wait a minute. Again, cultures are different and this one was. Even Esther as the queen, she couldn't simply run to her king and pour out her heart or her dismay of this situation. We have to understand that by law, people, they, if they came before the king without being invited by him, they would be executed. And this even included Esther. She hadn't even seen him for about 30 days, the Bible says, which is kind of odd if you think about it, but it was when the king would call her and it was primarily for sex. Uh, think of that. That's sad, but it's true. That's how their culture worked. Mordecai, he then issues this really, really powerful statement. He said this to Esther, and this is verse 14. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. In essence, Mordecai was saying to Esther, hey, this could be your moment. This could be the very reason why God has allowed you to become the queen. Nonetheless, God is still in control. Esther, she recognized the gravity of the situation, and then she made a proposal to her uncle. She asked him and instructed him, hey, gather all the Jews that you can, and let's jointly fast and pray together over the next three days. Then she would go and approach the king. Esther, she demonstrates courage, and it's mixed with godly wisdom. She wasn't praying about going to see the king. That was already settled in her heart. She simply wanted prayer support, and if she perished before approaching the king, so be it. She had incredible character. Now, how one responds to pressing situations, it's something always to consider. Now, could I ask you to consider Esther and Mordecai's example to pray and fast. Like many of us, they weren't together in one location, but they were together in purpose or they were being like-minded. And that's something important to hold on to. Our nation and our world could pause for a moment and seek God's face. Here are two points regarding fasting and prayer I'd like you to think about. Number one, fasting and prayer isn't a get out of jail free card. Sadly, sometimes people only pray or fast when things get dicey or it's like the last resort. If I could tell you today that if we just all prayed and fasted for three days, then this whole COVID-19 matter would go away or simply pass. That wouldn't be wise on my part. Because the truth is, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, nor do you. When it comes to fasting and prayer, we need to do that for the very right reasons. To seek God's face and to worship Him alone. To ground ourselves in his revealed word, the Bible. For unbelievers, it's to repent and turn to Christ. Point number two. Fasting and prayer unite believers. 
We see this with Esther and Mordecai and all the other Jews. As you know, America has grown increasingly divisive. And in the middle even of this turmoil or chaos, political battles are still raging much like a virus. I wish I could say that our churches are strongly knit together, but that isn't always the case either. Here's an important truth. God's purposes prevail even in the middle of frantic situations. Persecution, tragedy, famine, economic downturns, disease, all of these things occur under God's sovereignty. Maybe God is teaching us to rely on him more. Is it possible that God is asking his church, his people, to be more commonly united? Do we need to repent of our pettiness or lack of unity? I love what David wrote in Psalms 139. This was a prayer of his. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. How you and I respond to our circumstances, it's a good test of our character. Is our first initial response to seek God? That's the big question for today. And I would love to hear and see some of your comments on this on the post. Thank you for viewing this week's Sunday Spotlight. Until next time, serve Jesus well.